We are very privileged to have Dr. Jin with us today. Dr. Yishi Jin is a professor of neurobiology, which sounds really impressive. <laughs> she was a professor at UC San Diego, and um, she's going to be talking to us about the connections of a more physical kind. Dr. Jin. It is my first time and to be uh, with San Diego Assembly, but it's also first time for me to come over this area. Um, I live um, north. Um, so actually, uh, before I start, we already realized there could be a couple challenges. One is, as um, the little girl says, I just had my braces on after uh, 50 years, so it's kind of a feeling weird to speaking. And second, um, we realized the incompatibility between my computer and Dolores' computer. There might be movies that's not playing, so I will try either mimic or use my computer to show you the sun. Um, so it's, um, thank you for um, inviting me to come here to talk to you about my work. Um, I probably say as I started from China, but California has been my um, home state. Um, I got my PhD from Berkeley and then basically from Berkeley moved down to San Diego. Um, so what I will tell you, um, I'm really a researcher that working in the lab and that trained as a molecular biologist and learned about the genetics and worked with a laboratory animal to hoping to study, um, discover things that could be relevant to um, generally understanding of human and animals. So if you can, okay, so I think this days with computer and you know, the internet, you will see that the brain, our brain is very complicated. There's always um, lights that's firing. And what those firing is actually referring to a very minute structure, it's called a synapse. Um, synapse is actually means connection. And um, so the bottom one, since this laser pointer doesn't work, so the bottom is basically illustration of a synaptic connection by graphic design. But in a scientific world, the next slide is actually the very top is an illustration that the textbook, high schools or elementary school textbook you tell you, that is, a synapse has two, three parts. The very top is called um, presynaptic terminal, where there's little holes are little vesicles that will deliver a message. And then they have to be crossed to um, its partner, so those are called the postsynaptic. But in the real science, the, what the synapse look like it, is down the two uh, pictures. Those are real samples that's put it actually under electron microscope. And as a way to show you, in order to really see those textbook view, it requires many layers of technology. And its synapses is a tiny structure. That's why we use electron microscope. And um, so, but um, the, all that, subtle, you know, tiny structures, almost like we're building a house, made out of many molecules. So molecules means the proteins, the lipids, and sugars. And um, so one way to actually know what those um, proteins or molecules are, this is goes into the biochemistry, which basically means you're grinding up a brain and you try to figure out how many proteins are there. It turns out that in that tiny presynaptic terminal, there's over 1,000 um, different proteins. And um, just like we're building tiny things, you, you will have to, I'm actually, this is very cool, because this afternoon, I'm going to pack my house and then start my house remodeling. And I went to all the um, appliances telling me all these things. I said, why are there so many things? They said, yes, you have to have every single nails match the stuff. So um, the, similarly, um, the postsynaptic side also have many molecules. They're not identical. They needed to be in the right place in the um, presynaptic, meaning they relieve signal, and postsynaptic means we receive signal. They are different molecules. So 
the illustration there is very much a scientific jargon. Every single bowl, or oval shape, is a scientist illustrate that is a distinct protein and place them in the right place within that ultra uh, minute space. And um, next slides. The, the next point is basically is that the what got people or got me drive me to study synapses is the fact that there's increasing uh, information from human patients that link to genetic changes uh, to diseases. In particular, I'm passionate about autism, but there's also schizophrenia, and there are also degenerations of various cases. So essentially, um, oh, you're going to the next one. So, oh, too fast, sorry. If we can go back, um, I'll, I'll can see here. Um, so that's what, where my basic science coming from. But I don't work with human, I'm not doctor, and it's harder to work with human samples. So I work with this nematode, as you see here, Cineravidus elegans. Um, so it's working with this um, nematode is very simple. And on the side, it's just a desk with a microscope, a bunch of petri dishes. That's where I sit, and I look at the animal, and the animal just on that picture, the image. And I was hoping this um, movie play, but it doesn't. Basically, imagine nematode is just like a tiny snake. They will move around, and this is micro, but, but it, they're really wonderful. They're, they're, so the first thing I work with them, they're worm, but don't worry about it. This is actually free living worm. That is, um, they don't um, cause any parasite. They actually detect, it's good environmental detection um, a, um, organism to see how vi vibrant the environment is. Um, they're small, and I can see them. They, they don't require a whole lot of things to work with because they're cheap, that's the other thing, that to work in the lab. And uh, probably the most important for us is that this is the only animal, it is an animal, even if it's a worm, you can freeze them in dry ice, liquid nitrogen, thinking about you know the Disney, um, he wanted to be frozen and then revive. That's not gonna happen. But with, <laughs> but with this worm, you can free, we can freeze them, and then we can revive any day, any time. They will be exactly like the, what they're frozen. So that means we can store all the genetic information um, indefinite, and then give us a lot of time to um, work with. Okay, so the next slide is actually introduce you um, Sidney Brenner, and I don't know how many of you have heard him in um, different contexts. So he is called the father of C. elegans. Um, basically, he's a South African scientist, actually is a doctor, and then converted to do a basic science. He went to UK and he did a lot of fabulous things so telling us that uh, uh, how our proteins are made of amino acid. And, um, Perhaps this is right around the time I was born, and he decided it's time for him to explore a real organism rather than biochemistry. So he wrote a letter to his director, and you can read this sentence. If I actually read it, that might take a longer time. The bottom line is that he wrote a very simple proposal, 500 words, is that he wanted to play with an organism where he could use a genetic methods to really understand how its nervous system control movement, to control um, thinking. So that he got the funding support, and then he started next one. Um, so he chose, he actually came over to Berkeley uh, learned about, there's a big nematode um, biology department, learned about the various nematode from Berkeley professors, and then set his heart on this particular species called Cinerabaditis elegans, or C. elegans. One is, um, so this is a simple biology that essentially, uh, C. elegans is hermaphrodite, that is self-fertilized. So you don't need to do any difficulty to maintain them. And um, the eggs live uh, uh, outside the mother. And so it goes through all these processes you can see from fertilization to they become a young kid and then to um, grow up teenagers and finally become sexual mature again. It only takes about three days. So, 
very cool, huh? Um, so because it has such short life, then you can actually changing their DNA content to generate the genetic changes and ask what will happen to the animal. And then you can study that the molecular basis of life. Um, so um, the, this actually also very unique uh, nematode. The, uh, the, it, the number of cells uh, in making up this animal is fixed. There's a 959 from one to another. So everyone is identical. So that is also why geneticists always love this animal to study for its biology. And more so, let me just show, in fact, Sidney Brenner did the first uh, so-called genetic screen by feeding the animals with chemicals to change their DNA. Now you see this wiggly um, worm no longer move like a snake because it cannot move, so therefore it's called uncoordinated. So there's a lot of these mutations we ended up giving the name describe their mutant phenotype. It turns out this particular gene is absolutely essential for the synaptic signals from transmitted from the presynaptic terminal to post. Okay, so um, because this is um, you know general history, because he's a self-motivated uh, mission to really leading this field, he was awarded many prizes in about 2002, and he was given the Nobel Prize as being recognized to be the highest honor. In fact, he's actually a long-term resident of um, San Diego, because, um, next slide, um, that since 1976, and he preferred uh, to be closer to the ocean. He was affiliated with the Salk Institute. And there he basically um, wrote, um, studied. And he's also very good, not just a scientist, he's very good um, ethicist. So he wrote the columns and telling the young graduate students, young um, investigators, uh, what's it like, how to design um, a, you know, just general life around your choice. So he passed away just about a year ago. And um, for some of you would like to read, and there's a column called Uncle Sid, and uh, it's just one page. Um, he wrote for seven years, and um, one of the things we all love this, to tell, just share this, you can read, that, that is he self-advertised, he's a scientist, how to self-advertise in, in the era of Facebook, where you have to you know, advertise yourself. Um, so. That you can read that. I thought that was interesting without going through details. Um, there's a lot of history about, um, you can search on San Diego tribunes. Anyway, so now here comes to my work, I think. Next slide. So my work really is, again, is a, now showing you the electron micrographs that at the synapses, you need those vesicles and to hold uh, neurotransmitters and then to transmit signal to the postsynaptic cells. They're tiny, so the scale telling you they're very, very small. That is, not, cannot be detected by naked eyes. We do a lot of technologies. This is called um, e electron micrograph tom tomogram. That is, we literally collecting images of one nanometer um, on a section. And then we use computer to reconstruct it. So this movie just basically shows that we can resolve a single molecule, single vesicles, those uh, pink ones, and then there are different ones, so the red ones. They has to be come together to make that synapses. So this is the question that uh, I'm interested. How do the components come together? Next slide. And um, because they're very small, naked eyes can't uh, see it. And you really have to come up with a way um, to allow me to see as a researcher. So this comes to a lot of this driven by um, technology at the time. So this one, I presumably, uh, many of you have seen or heard about it. It's called the green fluorescent protein. Raise hands. Yeah, so you know, one of the fascinating things, just go to aquarium, there's all this jellyfish and they give you sparkling um, patterns because they have a protein that can just give you fluorescent, so that you can, especially good in Halloween, so that, you know, that, that kind of thing, this is a like fluorescent thing. So one of the technology was discovered over 25 years ago is that um, they can take a jellyfish protein and to place it in any organisms, 
and they can just, um, outside of jellyfish, they can still show green fluorescence, the slides shows there. So essentially, uh, basically, it's a jellyfish protein. You, on that plate, the blue is a bacteria. You see them fluorescent. And the middle one is a C. elegans. You see them green. And then Drosophila rabbit, actually. And then some people one time said there's a you know, monkey can be all uh, green monkeys as well. They're totally, so when um, animals taking this gene, they can totally live fine. There's, it's absolutely no harm to whatsoever. So therefore, this gave me the idea to start my own work. The next slide. It, oh, so this de development of this uh, uh, green fluorescent protein as a way to see things also won the Nobel Prize in 2008. And I presume they, some of you have heard uh, Roger Chen from UCSD. OK, so um, he's, a, he has, he, so he's, he's, a, he's a genius that in terms of developing all sorts of fluorescent proteins, all sorts of ways for, as he's a chemist training, and um, basically develop many reagents for us to see um, with the magic that essentially in the lab. Um, and all along with the others. And, um, and this technology using green fluorescence later on got another prize um, in 2014 that is so-called a super resolution microscopy. I mean, that's when it's basically allow you to see things within um, detection visual separation level. Okay, so next slide. Yeah, okay, 10 minutes already? I have 10 more? Okay. So, um, so the way I was thinking, this is a blow up that little black dots that I've just shown you into a single a gigantic um, computer illustration. That is, those single synapse vesicles are full of proteins. And there's many proteins that make them to function. But they have to be packed in a very small 70 nanometer size. So here it comes down to, so if I wanted to study how synapses, how vesicles gets to where they should be, and then I can put green fluorescent protein to one of the protein, okay? Now, next slide. So this is a very um, fascinating. And you see that um, my logo, my, the worm, that's a worm. And you see all those um, bright spots. Those are green fluorescent proteins that I put it into the C. elegans. And I put so, is actually the, the, put them together with a synaptic vesicle protein. And you see those uh, black and white ones. And there's a, um, the so-called uh, white puncture. Each one of them is ultra-structurally defined synapse, okay? And so that's the, basically, that's, that is my work. That essentially what I do is look at those individual um, dots, white dots. And, that, and then I says, okay, now I can see a synapse and then I can do genetics. That is, I can, next slides. That basically I uh, feed the C. elegans uh, with nasty chemicals and DNA gets changed, then I can see, oh, this molecule, there are three examples, and then it's called the SID1, SYD-1, dash dash 2. Every one of them, when they uh, mutated, meaning the protein is gone, and they start changing the shape of the dots that I'm looking at it, means they're changing the synapses. And it actually causes the synapses communication weakened, the animals shows behavior deficits. So my other side of work is then using a lot of the um, training my graduate students postdocs and working with those proteins, place them in synaptic terminal will be the next one. So essentially this is now textbook illustration is that each of the round green circle is a synaptic vesicle. Each of the protein that I worked with or identified is color coded and corresponding to the synaptic terminal as an illustration. So basically says I succeeded in seeing the synapse one and then actually find the molecules that's changing the synapses and then place those molecules in the synapses to say they're functionally important. And the important thing is that I worked with the C. elegans, and I should point out all these molecules are present in our body. OK, 
pay. So essentially, that's why I uh, use a lab to study the proteins and genes that's relevant to ourselves. Okay, so that's the first part of my work and that is how to study synapses. And now I'm going to talk about the second part of my work. Again, it's more related to uh, as I'm growing older, learning more things about relate my work to uh, medical applications. This is talking about axon regeneration, so slides. So um, axon regeneration, and actually it's been known over um, 1,500, 2,000 years from the doctors um, a record that is in adults when um, axon gets damaged for whatever reason, stroke or um, accident, and human will not be able to regenerate their axons, repair themselves. And scientifically, the person who studied this really extensively is that gentleman, that's Ramoni Cajal. Have anybody heard of him? He's a Spanish, um, so it's basically he's a Spanish uh, neuroscientist and was a doctor too. And he did this work in the old days and started in the uh, late 1900s that really is using microscope in his own kitchen. And so what you see here, that, that is not, it's not a lab, so microscope in front of him. And he basically took animal samples and then to crash their nerve, okay, or to transect their nerve. Afterwards, he looked at what happens to those axons, the damaged axons. So the image, the picture that's shown here, that really representative, that damaged axons in adults, they do not, they're not able to fix themselves. What they become is those, um, the, air, the red arrowheads, it, they become this so-called round ends. Those round ends are called dystrophic bulbs. That is the sign the axons start dying. They no longer can, can be alive. Okay, so therefore there's a lot of studies for us to ask that other ways to preventing the sign of death by preventing the formation of dystrophic bulbs. So, next slides. Now here, I um, develop a technology that is again with the C. elegans, it's very small, it's transparent, I can use GFP, ground fluorescent protein, to see those neurons, which you see here, that we call PLM. And um, I hope this movie does play the important thing. There you go, I use a laser and I cut those axons and then they start growing, okay? They start responding, responding, they grow, but they actually don't fix themselves. Even in C. elegans, that when they become mature and once they damage, they don't actually grow. So this then gave me a way to look for what, mutate the C. elegans genome, says what happens, what could promote them grow. And next slide. It's a big uh, slice, it's very dense. What it means is that um, a nematode, you probably don't see because they're micro, they're, they live in your soil or tomatoes or rotten apples. Um, they have about 21,000 genes. Human has 30,000 genes, okay? And out of that, 8,000 of our genes are exactly the same as C. elegans. So what I do is, to basically mutate those 8,000 nematode genes individually and ask them how, when they're gone, how to respond to this laser injury. Okay, so essentially you can see those the images that we'll do. Bottom line is we're able to find genes, the next one. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna skip this one because the movie doesn't do. Okay, so yeah, let's just keep it. So here's a gene that um, becoming very interesting. So what, when I see WT, that's what the normal uh, regenerating axon, that is it actually do grow and it has a sign of uh, growing. And then when you take this gene out, the middle panel, you see the growth distance is very short, okay? And they will become that um, dead sign. And, but if I actually make this gene more active, and then you can see now they grow a lot more, okay? Um, so this gene, we have, human have two, and worm C. elegans has one, 
And we can also find the next slides. Um, unfortunately, that movie doesn't play. Basically, we in the lab, we can study many ways. We can show how to actually increase this gene's activity. One of them is simple calcium. The calcium is a major signal. Okay, so next one. Um, the, the connection to it is our work from C. elegans showed that we active this uh, protein, the, um, the axons will grow more. And more recently, there's a study from UCLA Medical School actually shown is that patients suffered a stroke if they take this um, drug that inhibiting CCR5, which is uh, quite probably popularized because it linked it to HIV, and um, those patients actually recover faster from stroke. One of the reasons they recover faster is because in the human kinase, it become more active. Okay, so essentially, now we link our C. elegans findings and to human. The question is, what should be uh, everybody using CCR5 drugs? Probably not, so there's a, there's a way to go. Um, and the next one, there's another um, uh, interesting connection. Um, there's also, so basic scientists is basically finding a lot of things. For instance, in this particular case, that we know Alzheimer's and often come from accumulation of a particular proteins, in this case is apoproteins. And apparently, that when you have too much bad um, APOE proteins, and the, the kinase actually become reacting and gets activated. So there are things start thinking is that controlling or monitoring how this kinase from C. elegans to human, how to make them active or inactive, not only important for a motor cortex um, recovery repair, and can also help um, to preventing Alzheimer's. That, that's older generation, older people care a lot more. With all of that, I think I'm ending my talk. And that is, I will always, so all of this work, as I lead a lab at UCSD, you see the sun god, and this is a group of people who work tirelessly with me. And um, I have uh, also benefited from a lot of federal fundings as well as um, local UCSD fundings. Thank you.